Hello and welcome. My name is Mike Heaston and I am Senior Legal Counsel for the Student Press Law Center. Today's presentation looks at the free press rights of high school student journalists. This presentation is probably not going to make you a First Amendment expert, but what it will do, I hope, is provide basic information about your legal rights so that you can make more informed decisions. It should also help you understand when you might have a problem that requires outside help. For those situations, you may want to keep our contact information at the Student Press Law Center handy. The SPLC is a nonprofit organization founded nearly 50 years ago. We're based in Washington, D.C. The center provides free legal help and information to student journalists and their advisors on a variety of media law issues. Now, we're going to talk about censorship and press freedom today, uh, but we're ready to help you answer questions on pretty much any media law issue that comes up, including things like copyright law, uh, access to public records and meetings, libel law, privacy law, you know, pretty much anything that commercial news reporters have to deal with, student journalists have to deal with as well. So. Uh, uh, anyway, more information is available on our website, splc.org, and in various resources we produce. You can also use our hotline service to submit an email or schedule a telephone call with me or another member of our legal team to get some more specific information about your media law issue. Our hotline service is free and open to all student journalists and those who work with them. Okay, let's get started. So historically, uh, censorship has been the number one reason that high school student journalists have contacted the Student Press Law Center for legal help. But when we talk about censorship, what do we mean? Now, some forms of censorship are obvious. For example, where school or other government officials confiscate an entire issue of a student publication, or where they cut a specific story or photo, that's censorship where they restrict access to a student media website or social media account or pull the plug on a student TV or radio show because of its content. Um, that's also censorship, and those cases are easy to spot. Censorship can also occur in, and frequently does in more indirect and less obvious ways. For instance, censorship can occur where administrators sus suspend or otherwise discipline a student journalist for something they've written, or where they fire an advisor or fail to uh, renew the advisor's contract because the advisor allowed such publication. That's something the SPLC sees a lot these days, unfortunately. Um, budget cuts can also be a big source of illegal censorship, using their power of the purse uh, to control or manipulate or punish. Um, for instance, we've seen school officials refuse to allow attendance at a student journalism conference, or they've cut funding for promised equipment for student media uh, equipment. Um, and all because the student media has expressed some unpopular or controversial viewpoint. Now, this is just a partial list of this, these more indirect forms of censorship, but it is all censorship. So the idea is if you can show that an act by a school or student government official, actually, uh, any act, if you can show that that act has been motivated by content, the law may provide some relief. Uh, while school officials uh, and government officials always try to label such actions as something different, and while in some cases their acts may not violate the law, the idea is that when someone outside the newsroom uses their power to limit your expression, it's censorship. On the other hand, it's not censorship when a student editor changes or decides not to publish a staff reporter's a story or uh, a photographer's photo. Uh, editing is a normal and necessary part of news reporting, and it's not censorship as long as it's done by student editors and not by a school official, uh, including a student media advisor um, over the editor's objections. So several of theories attempt to explain why it's important to protect the, the right of a free speech and free press. First, a healthy democracy requires educated and informed citizens that have access to the very latest ideas and most accurate information from a wide variety of sources. Under this theory, speech competes in what is called the marketplace of ideas, where ideas and opinions are debated with, at least in theory, the most valuable speech emerging. A second rationale for press freedom is its importance in ensuring that the people, we the people, can keep an eye on those in power. It's often said that the media is the watchdog of government. And finally, uh, there are a number of other theories, but, but, but one of the more 
uh, common ones is more idealistic advocates of the First Amendment argue that it's the responsibility of the news media to bring about needed social change. As the conscience of society, the media should ferret out and publicize social media problems and injustices, this theory goes, in order to improve the plight of the underprivileged. Now, whatever the rationale, the essential role of a free press is nothing new and was widely recognized as amongst the most important goals of our country's founders. In fact, reacting to the ruthless acts of censorship practiced by most European governments of his day, Thomas Jefferson once famously noted that, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Of course, that is a very, very different message from ones we hear today. Such threats should remind all of us that the First Amendment is written on paper, not stone. There are no guarantees. If a free press is something we believe in, it's up to all of us, including the next generation of journalists and citizens, to stand on its behalf when necessary. As part of the Founders' plan to ensure that individual freedoms would be respected, they enacted the Bill of Rights, which is, as you know, the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Now, the very first of those amendments, the First Amendment, restricted the government's right to enact laws that interfered with five specific individual freedoms. Freedom of the press, assembly, petition, speech, and religion. Though the First Amendment contains exceptionally strong language limiting government interference, interference of those freedoms, Congress shall make no law, the amendment begins. Those rights are not absolute. At times, the freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment can conflict with other important rights or obligations, and a balance between the two must be reached. The First Amendment, where it's respected, remains a unique promise by a government that, but for exceptional reasons, it will not interfere with the right of its people, including its youngest citizens, to engage in personal freedoms deemed so essential. It's important to note, however, the distinction between the legal protections available to students attending public schools and those enrolled at private schools. The First Amendment, and I hope this isn't a surprise to any of the private school folks we have here in the audience here, uh, the First Amendment only prohibits censorship by government officials not by private individuals. For example, if I see you on the street with your save the whale sign, and if I rip it out of your hands and break it over my knee, uh, I've clearly acted like a big jerk and probably criminally assaulted you. But I have actually not violated the First Amendment because I'm acting as a private citizen. On the other hand, if a city police officer does the same thing, you've got a pretty clear First Amendment claim. Likewise, because private school administrators are not classified as government officials or state actors, they are not bound by the same constitutional limits as their public school counterparts. Now, whether legal protection is available or not, student media at private schools and public schools often find it most effective and almost always quicker to challenge censorship in the court of public opinion rather than a court of law. School officials who may not think twice about censoring often come unglued when they are publicly labeled censors. We have found that a well-planned student-led PR campaign calling out censorship has convinced many image conscious schools to reverse course. Here at the SPLC, we can help you with this. So even though the First Amendment does not generally prohibit censorship at private school student media, there may be other legal limits placed on the ability of private school officials to censor. So for more information, uh, please check out our private school guide or talk to a student press law center lawyer. For public high school students, however, it is a different story. Despite what school officials may claim or believe, Student journalists attending a public high school have important rights that school officials are legally obligated to respect. Please, if you remember nothing else today, remember this. There is no such thing as an unlimited license to censor at a public school.
Unfortunately, many school officials continue to cling to the notion that the law provides little or no protection to high school student journalists. In fact, one of the biggest myths is that school official administrators are the publishers of student media because the school may provide financial or other support. As publisher, the myth continues, they have the right to dictate what student media publish. In fact, the publisher comparison falls apart pretty quickly. First, private publishers do in fact own their publications. They pay the bills. A principal, on the other hand, no more owns the student newspaper than he or she owns the school buses to use for a family vacation. Where a student newspaper receives school funding, um, and obviously not all do, taxpayer money, not the school officials' private funds support the student media program. Most importantly, however, public school officials are government actors who are specifically limited by the First Amendment when it comes to restricting the free speech and free press activities of others. After all, as we just talked about, that's why the First Amendment exists. We don't want government officials dictating individual state speech. This distinction will always set a public school official apart from a genuine private publisher. So, of course, it's, easily, it's easy to simply proclaim that public school students have important First Amendment rights. But where specifically does, does, what specifically does the law say and how did we get here? Well, when talking about the First Amendment in public schools, any discussion must begin with the most important case on student speech rights ever handed down by the U.S. Supreme Court, Tinker v. Des Moines. Decided more than 50 years ago, the Tinker decision, often simply known as the armband case, is still the law and is cited in almost every legal opinion involving student, uh, student speech rights. The Tinker case began on December 16, 1965. Now, in 1965, the Vietnam War was escalating. Robert F. Kennedy, in fact, had called for a Christmas truce, and a small group of students in Des Moines, Iowa, wore black armbands to school that day in support of RFK's position and to mourn the death of those already killed in the war. Among those students was a quiet 13-year-old eighth grader named Mary Beth Tinker, whose family had a long history of advocating for peace and social justice issues. Now, one part of the now famous story that's not widely known is that a high school student newspaper in the district actually wrote about the planned protest a few days before it occurred. In response, the school board passed an emergency rule that banned the wearing of armbands in school. As she tells the story now, Mary Beth was terrified to break a school rule, something she had never done before. But she says she was able to use just that, quote, little bit of courage she had that morning to wear her small homemade black armband. Now, over half the day passed quietly and without incident, but just as her afternoon algebra class began, she was called down to the principal's office and ordered to remove her arm, armband. She did so. My little bit of courage ran out, she now says. Nevertheless, the principal suspended her and sent her home. Eventually, the school suspended a total of five students, including Mary Beth's high school-aged brother, John, and a friend, Chris Eckhart, for wearing the armbands to school. After the school board refused to overturn their suspensions and following heated debate on both sides, which actually included death threats against the Tinker family, Mary Beth, Mary Beth, Chris, John, and some of the other students sued the school district. Four years and two courts later, in 1969, the United States Supreme Court handed down its decision. By a 7-2 to two vote, the court ruled for the students. In its now famous line from its decision, the court said that neither students nor teachers shed their constitutional rights to freedom of expression or speech at the schoolhouse gate. The court, however, recognized the unique nature of schools and the legitimate concerns of school officials in maintaining a productive learning environment. The court, as it usually does in such cases, created a balancing test to weigh the competing interests. The balancing test the court came up with, now widely referred to as the Tinker Standard, was this. Before school officials could censor a student's on-campus speech, they first had to show that the speech either one, invade, invaded the rights of other students or others, 
uh, at school, or two, created a material and substantial disruption of normal school activities. Only where school officials could overcome that constitutional hurdle would censorship be allowed. So let's look at the first part of the test. Some types of speech are simply not protected by the First Amendment. Speech that falls into an unprotected speech category can be lawfully punished and in some cases prohibited. And the First Amendment will do nothing to stop it. Some of the more common categories of unprotected speech include libel, invasion of, copy, uh, of privacy, and copyright infringement. These categories, however, are not simply labels that school officials can apply at their whim. Rather, they are legal terms that are usually defined by a substantial body of law. In other words, before a school official can legally censor speech by calling it libelous, he or she had better understand the specific elements of a libel claim and the standards of libel applied by the relevant courts. Other common categories of protected speech include so-called fighting words or the promotion of illegal drug use in a school setting and speech that poses a, what we call a true threat, such as a bomb threat. Obscenity is also not protected by the First Amendment. True obscenity, which is mainly limited to extremely graphic visual depictions of sex, almost never appears in student media. However, courts have allowed censorship of in-school student speech, at least at the high school level, that is something less than true obscenity and probably falls into a category that is more accurately uh, described as indecent or vulgar. That includes the use of lewd and sexually suggestive, suggest, excuse me, that includes the use of lewd and sexually suggestive speech and more serious profanity. In most cases, it would not include straightforward clinical speech on sexual topics or the use of less offensive four-letter words in a newsworthy context. More information about the various uh, uh, categories of unprotected speech is available on the SPLC website. The second category of speech that can be lawfully censored under Tinker is expression on school grounds that would cause a material and substantial disruption of school activities. In fact, there have been very few cases where courts have actually found student expression disruptive enough to justify censorship. It's not enough to simply show that the speech is controversial or that it would offend or hurt the feelings of listeners. In most cases, the courts have required that would-be censor show that the speech would create a serious physical disruption that would not allow normal school activities to continue. For example, an editorial in a school newspaper that encourages students to participate in a class walkout to protest gun violence in schools and that provides specific information regarding when, where, or how to take part in that protest could be considered materially disruptive and not protected under Tinker. That's the sort of speech that if people follow the instructions, would lead to a serious physical disruption of school activities. On the other hand, an editorial that was critical of existing gun laws and encouraged students and their parents to contact lawmakers or the school board to vo voice their disapproval, while it might upset some, it's unlikely that would, serious, that would, uh, that would seriously interfere with the school's day-to-day -day operations, and it would uh, likely not be considered disruptive under Tinker. Courts have also required that before school officials can censor such speech, they must have more than you know, just a hunch that a, dis that a disruption will occur. They must be able to provide evidence to a judge that reasonably forecasts that the speech would result in a serious physical disruption. The impact of Tinker, then and now, is really hard to overstate. As of 2019, the decision had been cited in well over 2,000 cases by judges to uphold all types of student expression on campus. For the first time in 1969, the court recognized that young people, like all persons, have constitutional rights that school officials must respect. It was Tinker, for example, that forced university presidents to allow anti-war student protests during the late 60s and 70s, which were largely credited with bringing an end to the conflict in Vietnam. In fact, Mary Beth and her brother were recently recognized in a book by, uh, by historians as amongst the 101 rebels and radicals that have most changed American history. 
uh, along with uh, others whose names we all know, like Martin Luther King, Muhammad Ali, Albert Einstein, Rosa Parks, and even Geronimo. Fortunately for all of us in the student media world, the tinkers are still doing their thing, talking to young people across the country and reminding them of the significant power they have. In fact, a few years back, Mary Beth and I spent a school year traveling around the country on a bus tour, passing through 41 states and two countries while making more than 100 stops as part of what we called the Tinker Tour. Our hope was to remind young people of the importance of speaking their truth and saying what they need to say. Young voices, which are less concerned with sticking to the status quo, aren't just nice to hear. They are desperately needed right now. One of the tour's highlights was actually being invited back to Mary Beth's old junior high school in Des Moines, Iowa, where uh, instead of being suspended, the school officials dedicated her old locker as the Tinker First Amendment locker. As noted, Tinker truly did change things. And for nearly two decades following the Supreme Court's decision in 1969, Tinker remained the sole standard for analyzing all cases involving any form of student speech, including student media censorship. In most of those cases, applying Tinker, the administrative censorship was struck down as unconstitutional. In 1988, however, the Supreme Court agreed to hear its first uh, and so far only case uh, specifically addressing the censorship of a high school student newspaper. In the spring of 1983, students working on the Spectrum student newspaper at Hazelwood East High School, which is just outside St. Louis, Missouri, uh, they decided to publish a special two-page spe section in their newspaper that would focus on the issues facing teens at the time. The section included two articles, one on teenage pregnancy and the other on the impact of divorce on students uh, that resulted in the principal pulling the entire section from the newspaper. Now, applying Tinker, which was the law at the time, the case seemed like an easy call. The articles contained no unlawful or unprotected speech, nor did school officials claim that the articles would have caused a serious physical disruption to the school. When people read these articles, they weren't going to freak out or riot or anything like that. They weren't going to leave, they weren't going to leave class. Uh, but rather, the principal claimed he censored the articles because, among other things, he felt the topics were inappropriate for a high school audience. Now, when neither side backed down, editor Kathy Kohlmeyer and reporters Leslie Smart and Leanne Tippett filed lawsuits. After four years in, lower court, in the lower courts and much publicity, the case made its way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which handed down a decision that surprised and disappointed many First Amendment advocates. Now, rather than simply applying the Tinker standard to the case, which almost certainly would have meant a victory for the student journalists, a five-person majority of the justices concluded that the facts of Hazelwood were, dis were significantly different from those it had considered in Tinker. Mary Beth's armband, the court said, was private or independent speech. She made the armbands and wore them all on her own. The Hazelwood Spectrum newspaper, on the other hand, was funded by the school, produced as part of a journalism class and overseen by a journalism teacher paid by the school. It was, the court said, school-sponsored student speech, which the court concluded fell into a new and different legal category, and that required the application of a new and different legal standard. The Supreme Court said that school officials could now, under this new Hazelwood standard, they could now censor some school-sponsored student speech, including the spectrum, where the censorship was, quote, reasonably related to a legitimate pedagogical concern. In other words, the court said censorship would now be allowed in school-sponsored uh, student media where school officials showed they had a reasonable educational justification for their actions. Sounds reasonable until you actually start to ask yourself, what does it really mean? Now, one thing that was immediately clear to everyone was that, the, that, that Hazelwood had lowered the legal bar that had protected student speech. How low? What exactly? was a reasonable educational justification that allowed for administrative censorship. 
Unfortunately, the court did almost nothing to provide clarity. The Hazelwood decision included some examples of censorship that would satisfy the new standard that are truly shocking in their, in their vagueness and breadth. For instance, the court said under Hazelwood, school officials could censor speech that was, quote, poorly written, inadequately researched, biased or prejudiced or ungrammatical. And these were all in quotes because these are, these are taken directly from the, uh, the Supreme Court decision. The court went on to say that censoring inappropriate contact content, which was the principal's excuse uh, in Hazelwood, was now also okay, though they provided no definition or any individual guidance about what exactly made something inappropriate. The court also said school officials could censor student speech was, and I hope you'll truly take a moment to think about this one. School officials, the court said, could now censor, censor speech that was, quote, inconsistent with the shared values of a civilized social order. Now, whether you're a student or an administrator, it's pretty tough to come up with a fair and workable definition of what that means. In the nearly two decades since Tinker, the court had changed and Hazelwood was all about giving school officials more power to censor, much more. Such deference to government censorship had really only been seen once before in recent history. In 1987, the year before Hazelwood, the court had given prison wardens the authority to censor prisoner speech using the same legal framework they now gave to public school principals. It's important to know where your rights come from. Predictably, Hazelwood led to an explosion in the censorship of high school student media reported to the Student Press Law Center. If all school officials have to show is that a censored news article is, quote, poorly written, or that an opinion column is inconsistent with the shared values of a civilized social order, the First Amendment's shield is really more like a sieve. Okay. While Hazelwood is undeniably bad news for high school student journalists, its reach, it's important to remember, its reach is not unlimited. First, and this is a biggie, Hazelwood only applies to school-sponsored student speech. Independent, non-school-sponsored student expression continues to be protected by the Tinker Standard. So Mary Beth's armband, which she made on her own, non-school-sponsored speech, would be protected. But while the armband might have been protected, today there's a lot of other things that are also protected. There's a ton of non-school sponsored speech out there. Because unlike in 1965 when the Tinkers wore their armbands, which was really one of the few speech tools available to them at the time, students today have speech tools that the Tinker kids could only have dreamed of. Private websites and blogs and social media and all its forms are protected at a minimum by Tinker as are underground or independently produced student publications. Students have the right to reasonably distribute independently produced media on school grounds while students are present, as long as it contains no unprotected speech and would not create a serious physical disruption. Second, Hazelwood does not apply to speech that takes place in student media established either by policy or practice as what we call public forums, which is something we'll touch upon uh, more in just a moment. And finally, even under Hazelwood, school officials must demonstrate that they do, in fact, have a reasonable educational justification for their censorship. They cannot censor something for no reason or simply because they dis disagree with the viewpoint it expresses. There are a growing number of cases where courts have found that school officials fail to meet the Hazelwood standard uh, in all sorts of student speech contexts. But one of the most important occurred in Michigan. That case, called Dean versus Utica Community Schools, made clear that high school student journalists retain First Amendment protection that school officials ignore at their peril. The case began in early 2002, when Katie Dean was a junior and an editor for The Arrow, Utica High School's award-winning student newspaper. She and a fellow staff member, Dan Butts, had learned that their school district in Utica, Michigan was being sued by a husband and wife who claimed that uh, school bust exhaust fumes had contributed to the husband's lung cancer. 
the husband, uh, the couple lived next to the school district's bus garage, and they claimed that buses were frequently allowed to idle for extended periods of time, uh, particularly in the winter, uh, resulting in heavy diesel fuels kind of just lifting up from the school bus garage and settling into their house in their neighborhood. In researching the story, Dean and her staff contacted the school district, who, the story noted, refused to comment. She also included information in the story about the alleged uh, carcinogenic effects of breathing diesel fumes. Journalists and journalism educators who later looked at the story agreed that it was well-researched, well-written, and journalistically sound. Nevertheless, in March 2002, Utica High School's principal ordered the Arrow's veteran advisor to pull the story in an accompanying uh, editorial and cartoon. School officials claimed that the story was based on unreliable sources and contained a number of inaccuracies. They also claimed that it was inappropriate, remember that word? It was inappropriate for the student newspaper to write about a legal case in which the school district was involved. Not wanting to uh, delay distribution of the entire issue, the Arrow staff removed the censored material and sent the paper to the printer with an editorial on censorship. Next to the editorial was a black box with censored stamped in white lettering. Dean also decided to fight the censorship in court. A year later, after school officials had repeatedly refused to reconsider their decision, she filed a lawsuit against the school district. The Aero staff also took their case public, garnering wide support at both the state and national level. In fact, a month after school officials censored Dean's article from the Aero, the local commercial newspaper published it in full, along with an editorial condemning the censorship. Still, school officials continued to maintain that Hazelwood supported their decision to censor. In October 2004, nearly two and a half years after school officials censored the arrow, the court issued its opinion. After examining evidence and hearing courtroom testimony, the judge called the school censorship indefensible. The case was an important victory for just about all public high school student journalists working on school-sponsored media. First, the judge found that the arrow was a speech forum where students and not school officials were primarily responsible for determining the newspaper's content. Hazelwood, the court noted, does not apply to student media where students have been given the authority to make their own content decisions, either by a written school district policy or by an established practice. Such student media organizations are considered public forums and are protected at, uh, by Tinker. To reach this conclusion, the judge examined a number of factors to determine the degree of control school officials exercised over the arrow. In reaching his decision, the judge noted that the students had no practice of submitting the content to school officials for prior review, nor did the faculty advisor ever regulate the topics the newspaper covered. The judge also found that for more than two decades, school district officials had never, in fact, intervened in the editorial process. However, not all factors weighed in favor of the arrow. For example, the judge noted that the arrow was produced as part of a class and not as a purely extracurricular activity. Nevertheless, on the whole, the court determined that the newspaper was a forum for student expression that was subject to Tinker and not Hazelwood. Now, fortunately for all student media, the judge also said that regardless of the arrow's forum status, he still would have ruled that school officials violated the First Amendment because their censorship did not meet Hazelwood's reasonable educational justification standard. Katie Dean's article, the court found, was well-researched and well-written, and the administration's reasons for censoring it had no merit. Good student journalism, the judge decided, prevails. For years, too many school officials have assumed that Hazelwood's broad, vague language gave them an unlimited license to censor. This decision makes clear that's not the case. As the judge noted in his opinion, if the role of the press in a democratic society is to have any value, all journalists, including student journalists, must be allowed to publish viewpoints contrary to those of state authorities. As noted, Hazelwood does not apply to student media where students have been given the authority to make their own content decisions. Now, 
this can be done by a local uh, school district policy, an established practice, or by state law. Following Hazelwood, some state lawmakers concluded that the Supreme Court had gone too far in restricting the free speech rights of students. So think of the, I want you to think of the Federal First Amendment as a floor, okay? While states can never pass a law that provides less free speech protection than that required by the First Amendment, they can always pass a law that provides more. And that's what so-called New Voices laws are all about. In a nutshell, uh, New Voices legislation, which have also been called anti-Hazelwood laws, effectively turn back the clock to before Hazelwood. They restore tinker-level protections that require school officials to show that speech is either unlawful or disruptive before they can censor it. It gets rid of a school official's authority to censor speech simply by declaring it poorly written or inappropriate or one of the other flimsy Hazelwood-based excuses. New Voices laws are game changers. So far, more than a dozen states have enacted New Voices legislation, and it truly, it makes all the difference. In fact, if you call the Student Press Law Center for help uh, with a censorship problem, the first question I'm going to ask you is, what state are you calling from? If you are practicing sound journalism and calling from one of the states listed here, chances are excellent that your speech is protected and that the would-be censors will need to back off. In addition to protection from censorship, many of the laws also contain protection for advisors from being fired or punished for standing up for their students. Most contain language that protects the school district from liability for work published by student media. And more recently passed laws contain protection for college student media as well as high schools. And a couple, California and Rhode Island, actually include protections for private school student media. If you're in a New Voices state, get a copy of your law now and read it. If you are not in a New Voices state and want to be, the Student Press Law Center can help you get started. In fact, at least a couple of the campaigns for laws that are now on the books were started by students sitting in your seats who listened to a presentation just like this. If a state law isn't on your radar for now, look local. Uh, local school boards across the country, often prompted by student demands, have passed district policies limiting administrative censorship. They work essentially the same as a state law, just on a smaller scale. For more information, including sample policies and legislation, please visit the SPLC website. In an ideal world, no student journalist or advisor would ever be say, faced with a censorship conflict. But censorship in our post-Hazelwood world is an unfortunate reality for many, and you need to be pre prepared. The SPLC has a checklist that provides some time-tested strategies for winning a censorship battle. You can find a copy on the center's website. Now, we don't have time to go over everything on the list, but I want to, admit, to at least mention two points. First and most importantly, nothing can help you more in your censorship fight than a well-researched, well-written, fair and accurate story. Likewise, nothing can sink you faster than a sloppy, mean-spirited article full of factual errors and grammatical mistakes. Write something you'd be proud to stand by and defend publicly because that's what you may be called upon to do. Before publishing a story that you know might provoke a censor's pin, take the time to make it censor resistant. Carefully check all the facts, confirm your quotes, make sure you have talked to all sides. Ask yourself, does this make sense? Is it fair? Have multiple sets of eyes review it for grammar, spelling, punctuation, edit and editorial errors. In short, be a good journalist. Don't give censors an easy target. Second, the law related to free expression in school is unique. Every case has its strengths and weaknesses, and it's important that you're able to accurately, accurately assess where you stand. Sadly, few administrators know or sometimes even care about 
the law related to student free speech rights. Too often they act without taking the time to figure out what they lawfully can and cannot do. You may need to help educate them. Hopefully after today, you feel better prepared to explain the relevant legal standards and to refute their erroneous belief that public school officials can censor at will. Well, that's it. That's all I have for you today. Now, of course, we haven't covered everything and you may have more questions. As noted earlier, the SPLC website is packed full of resources on student press law issues. And of course, you could talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, with me or one of our other lawyers using our free legal hotline. On behalf of the Student Press Law Center, I thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. We hope you have found it helpful.